Well, uh, today we have, uh, actually last week we began uh, the focus on the outward journey, which is uh, the one, two, three part, third part of our, our 360 uh, experience. And um, uh, last week, Brother Santiago uh, really uh, issued the clarion call to live outside of ourselves. Uh, the inward look focus had us looking at the inside of our being, opening us up and allowing the Holy Spirit to search and renew and uh, remove some of the things within us that would impede our progress as living uh, under the Lordship of Christ as disciples. And so last week, Brother Santiago said, hey, it's not all about you. And so we were challenged to live in such a way where we would maximize an opportunity if it was presented even spontaneously. And so I just want us to recognize today that as noble as that is, it cannot be dismissed as romantic. It is a noble thing to live beyond yourself and to use your resources for the betterment of mankind and to see broken humanity and seek through whatever way possible to solution it. But it is not romantic and it is not without struggle. It is not without resistance and tension. And for me, I'm reminded of Paul's words uh, in Corinthians when he says to God, three times I asked you to take this stone away from me. And right now, we don't know, theologians debate, whether it was physical, emotional, or spiritual. Really, I don't know. All I do know is that it was something that, something that threatened his resolve to live in such a way where others were more important than himself. And God's response to him was not, okay, Paul, I'll take it away and make this journey more easy for you. Paul, God's words to Paul was, I will give you grace and my grace is sufficient for you. Where you are weak, you will be made, made strong. I want you all to think about that this morning as we look at this next story. Me and Mark, we, uh, we met in high school at Paul Harding High School around the 10th grade. We kind of hit it off. Uh, I started cutting him and his brother's hair, started getting to know him. He got to know me a little bit. And then uh, we kind of, you know, started getting into some some things that uh, you know was not right as far as uh, you know we got into you know selling drugs in school and stuff like that after high school you know we kind of went our own separate ways I went off start cutting here uh, Mark uh, he moved out of town he uh, started doing a little bit more of uh, you know selling drugs and stuff like that but we still kept kept in contact and then uh, back in uh, 2004 he moved to Cleveland and um, he got shot uh, seven times. After he got shot, uh, they only gave him 24 hours to live. It's been two years since. He was in a nursing home in Cleveland, and then he came here to Fort Wayne, to where he's at right now. And uh, I really didn't know what to expect when I when I heard that he was back. I knew that uh, I knew that he had got shot in the head, and he got shot, you know, in some other places. I knew you know, from other sources that he had to get rehabilitated. But, you know, it was to my surprise that, you know, he was in good spirits. You know, he was, uh, he was very joyful and, you know, just had a positive outlook on life. And so, uh, you know, we started talking and, you know, before this, he was not per se a Christian. But uh, as a result of this, he gave his life to the Lord. And now what he wants to do is uh, he wants to go and talk to youth about the consequences of the lifestyle that he chose. I'm just doing all that I can to, you know, to, to be an assistant to him. We go out and, and uh, minister at Primetime Youth Center, uh, Pontiac Youth Center. Uh, we've even been at Fellowship on Sunday nights uh, just sharing the story of, uh, you know, how, to, how the Lord redeemed his life from, you know, the path that he was heading down. August 26th of this year, it be exactly two years from the day that this happened to me. I got to re live the rest of my life like this, blind and then partially paralyzed on my left side, and I lost my friend. I still try to ask myself, what is it I could have done that day that could stop this from happening? Anything that day that I lost, I wish I could hand it back. It, it's, not, it's, it's not the money that was took. It's not the jewelry that was took. But it was the, um, the life, the life of my friend. She wasn't as fortunate as I was. 
She didn't even make it. I made it. And I thank God for that. He gave me a second chance. What I want to do now is repay God. So this life right here, I owe to God. And the best way to pay him back is to work for him, do his services, pay and ask him what he want me to do, and try my best to do them. And I figure that if I tell my story to enough people, and if at least one person was to get something out of it, I would consider myself as being a success. And so that's what I'm gonna try to do. Or oh, I'm not gonna try to do it, I'm gonna do it. I just thank God for, you know, just being in his life because he's actually a blessing to me. You know, a lot of people may not see that, but you know, I'm perfectly fine. And you know, me over here thinking that, you know, I got problems and stuff like this. But when I see Mark, I see that, you know, uh, he's having joy in the midst of, you know, the trials that he's gone through and, you know, the condition that he's in right now. And so it encourages me. But I believe that those who, who have already tasted and seen how good God is, we should be the ones going out and, and helping uh, uh, prepare the people who don't know God to get ready. That's what our job is as when God has brought us out of the darkness into his marvelous light, we need to be, uh, we need to go back into uh, the war and, and begin to save some individuals in the power of God. We shouldn't let fear overcome us by not uh, sharing our story with those that we don't know uh, because we're scared of what they may think of us or whatnot, or feeling like, you know, my story isn't good enough or, you know, I don't want to disclose certain things about me. Um, God wants us to, uh, to, to tell the story and tell it how it is so that some may be saved. When things like this happen, you find out who your, who your true friends are. Cause we, when you out there living that life, and you you got all kind of people around you, then when something happened to you, those that you didn't see around that much while you was doing all that, that done the main ones there. That's like, hey, I still love them by your side. Whatever you want to do, I'm with you. And then try to help you and guide you into the right direction. That's the kind of friend I like. And that friend, that's the friend that I found in Asia. It's a powerful testimony. Philippians 4, 4 says it this way. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. God is worthy to be praised in the good times and in the bad times. Can I get an amen on that one? He is still on the throne, whether we're going through the valley or we're on the mountaintop. He is still worthy to be praised. And the one thing that baffles the, uh, the enemy is when in the midst of our trials, we can still let out a, a shout. We can still rejoice. Paul and Silas did the same thing. When they were in prison, they let out a, a a gospel chorus in there that just baffled the enemy. 